Leia here from LeiaForSci.com and in this video we're going to look at specific rotation calculations when it comes to optical activity. You can find this entire video series on my website along with the chirality practice quiz and cheat sheet by visiting LeiaForSci.com slash chirality. In the last video we looked at the polarimeter and the concept that when plane polarized light enters the polarimeter that contains a pure chiral sample, meaning an optically active sample, the light will be rotated either clockwise in the positive direction or counterclockwise in the negative direction so that when it comes out the other end there is some degree of observed rotation. You can tell that the plane polarized light slightly changed direction. This rotation is called the alpha value where alpha refers to observed rotation. There are many things that will change the observed rotation because it specifically depends on the light hitting a molecule and that molecule turning it either to the right or the left. So what can impact that observed rotation? Concentration. If you have chiral molecules in a solution, as the light is passing through, the light bumps into a chiral molecule, it gets turned a little bit. Bumps into another molecule, gets turned a little more. The more chiral molecules you have in your sample, the more the light bumps into those molecules and the more the light gets turned because every time it hits another molecule, it turns just a little bit more. Another thing that impacts rotation is the length of the tube. The longer the length of the polarimeter, meaning the longer the path the light has to travel, the more opportunity it has to bump into molecules. In a short tube, it goes through, hits a couple molecules, gets out the other end. But as that tube gets longer and longer, it has to travel through even more molecules, bumps into more of them, and has greater potential to turn. That length of the tube is considered the path length because it's the length of the path that light has to travel. These are directly related to the polarimeter, the tube that you're using. But then we have two more outside factors. Temperature. Remember that temperature is a measure of internal energy of a system and if you're looking at a higher temperature the system is moving faster and if it's moving faster that will impact how the light travels and hits the molecules. And finally if what we're looking at is light then changing the light source or the wavelength of light that we're using is also going to impact our numbers. If every scientist is running their own experiment, you need a way to be able to refer to what you have compared to someone else so that you can compare data. Just like we have SI units and IUPAC rules for naming, we also have a standard system for the optical activity, and that is the specific rotation. Specific rotation is alpha in brackets where the brackets tell us standard rather than just an observed value and it has a very specific set of conditions. That includes a concentration of one gram per milliliter, this is how we measure concentration in a polarimeter, and a path length that is equal to one decimeter, where if you think of deci as a tenth, it's a tenth of a meter or simply ten centimeters. But if you're running an experiment, chances are you don't have standard conditions and you need a way to equate what you have to this. Specific rotation is specific to that molecule. It's like a constant, like the melting point or the boiling point or even the KSP value. But if you think back to GenChem and KSP, it did change dependent on temperature. That means we have to take a look at those final two factors. So if you have conditions that are not specific, here's how you set up your equation. Specific rotation, which is a number that you can get out of a reference table, is equal to alpha, the observed rotation, divided by concentration times path length. Where alpha is the observed rotation, concentration is measured in grams per milliliter, and path length is measured in decimeters. But just like other factors in your reference table, for example KSP, that K was temperature dependent. 
Two more things you want to include here with your specific rotation would be your temperature and your wavelength. Temperature would be constant, you set it to a specific temperature, and wavelength has to do with the type of light source that you're using for this experiment. For example, if I look at R2-bromobutane, I looked up the specific rotation for R2-bromobutane, and this is what I found. Specific rotation 20D is equal to negative 23.1, and specific rotation 25D is equal to negative 13.5. What is happening here? The specific rotation changes based on the temperature, 20 or 25 degrees Celsius, and D tells us not so much a wavelength number, but the light source which has an applied wavelength. In this case, it's the D line of sodium at 589 nanometers. Just an FYI, you don't have to know this. Using this information, I can easily figure out the specific rotation for S, remembering that R and S are enantiomers. So if R is levorotatory, it turns light to the left or the negative direction. S, in this case only, will be dextrorotatory, meaning turns light in the positive direction. S at 20 degrees will be positive 23.1. S at 25 degrees will be positive 13.5. Going back to our equation, your professor won't always be so nice, and sometimes you'll be asked to calculate different values. For example, what is the expected observed rotation given conditions? What do you do? You want to isolate your alpha, not in brackets, your regular alpha for observed, by using simple algebra to move everything over to the other side. So we'll multiply both sides by concentration and path length. That allows C and L to cancel, concentration and path length on the other side, which gives us a new equation that alpha, or observed rotation, is equal to alpha in brackets specific rotation times concentration times path length. Let's try an example. A student attempts to separate R and S to butanol. The final solution is 0 0.25 molar at 25 degrees. Was the student successful if a 10 centimeter cell shows a negative 2.5 rotation using the D-line of sodium? We're given the following information from a reference table, and we want to figure out if the student was successful in separating between R and S. When you're given a problem like this, there's a whole lot of words, and that makes it very confusing. What you want to do is see if you can pull out the numbers from the story and come up with a simple equation. In this situation, if we are given a specific rotation and an observed rotation and asked if we're successful, what we're translating this to is simple. Does the alpha observed match the alpha specific or is something wrong here, meaning is the solution not pure? If the solution was properly separated, we should be able to calculate one from the other. And I purposely made the example this way because some professors will ask you to calculate alpha specific, some will ask you to calculate alpha observed, and I want to make sure you can do both. Recognize that some of this information is very nice to have if you're doing this in lab, but we honestly don't care on paper. For example, 25 degrees Celsius, great. This is at 25 degrees Celsius, so we're good. We don't need to worry about it. And D simply tells us what type of light we're using. In this case, the D line of sodium. It has nothing to do with dextro or levorotatory, so we don't care about that. Note that it's there, ignore it, move on to the problem. The fact that we have a negative observed rotation and negative 13.52 for R, we know that we're looking at the R sample, but is it just R or is there some S still left in there? We'll use the equation, specific rotation is equal to observed rotation divided by concentration times path length. And in the first version, we're going to plug in all the experimental data and see if this is correct, meaning if it gives us the correct specific rotation. If it does, we know we're good. If it does not, we know that the solution is not what we expected. It's not pure R. So what do we have? An observed rotation of negative 2.5 degrees concentration of 0 0.25 molar, and a path length as 10 centimeters. Problem is we don't want centimeters, we want decimeters. 10 centimeters is equal to 1 decimeter, so that simply gives us a 1. 
Punching this into the calculator, you get negative 10 degrees, which is what we would expect for the specific rotation if this was the observed rotation of pure R, which it is not telling us the student did not do a proper separation. To solve it the other way, let's see what a pure R solution would give us for the observed rotation under these conditions. One more time, we start with the equation specific rotation equals observed rotation divided by concentration times length. Move concentration times length over to the other side to cancel out. That allows us to isolate observed rotation, giving us the new equation. Alpha observed is equal to specific rotation times C times L. And then we plug in the numbers. We are given negative 13.52 degrees for specific rotation. Multiply that by 0.25 molar for concentration and one decimeter for path length. Plugging all that into the calculator, we get negative 3.38 degrees as the ideal observed rotation if this was just an R solution. The fact that the observed rotation is less than negative 3.38, it's negative 2.5 tells us there's some s remaining in there. The next question your professor might ask is figure out what percent of this solution is R or S, or figure out the enantiomeric excess of what we have also known as optical purity. And that is exactly what we'll cover in the next video, which you can find along with the stereochemistry practice quiz and cheat sheet by visiting my website, layerforsci.com chirality.